All right, here we are on this uh, Sunday morning. Uh, we've got Thanksgiving coming up. And Luby, we were talking about that earlier. One of the things that people forget, it should be Thanksgiving. Instead of just Thanksgiving, but giving thanks. We know that. But it ought to be a time of, to stop back and, and ask ourselves, how am I giving back? You know, and to be thankful for that. But there, but one of the things that I've noticed, and I, I preach this particular sermon uh, normally during the Sunday school hour, but since we're no longer having Sunday school, I've chose to preach it during this hour. And so we're in Numbers chapter 11, and I want to show you uh, the the sin of complaining and the consequences that goes with it, all right? So just being aware, and that's, it's one thing to have a conversation if you have a problem and you're trying to resolve it. But when people complain, they normally step back and remove all responsibility from their part. And that's where the problem lies. So in Numbers chapter 11, verse 1, this was, they were going from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barney. And, uh, and yet, uh, the people are going to respond to God by complaining, all right? So Numbers chapter 11, verse number 1. And when the people complained, notice this, notice the response of God. It displeased the Lord, and the Lord, what? Heard it. Okay, I want you to underline that or highlight that in yellow in your Bibles. It's a very important statement there. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. So we've learned that, uh, that complaining, uh, just constant, consistent complaining, it's a sin. And I'll tell you why here in a moment. In fact, uh, it says not only when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, they heard it. And look here, and his anger was kindled. That's like you took a fire and just really, you know, put a lot of air in it to a lot of fuel. It just blares up. Well, he says that, that the Lord was not only what was he displeased, not only did he hear it, but his anger was kindled. It was fueled. And the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. So in other words, people died. That's how serious the sin is. Because it, and we'll talk about this and how it's like a domino effect, all right? In Lamentations chapter 3, verse 39, we're reminded, Wherefore doth a living man complain, a man for the punishment, listen, of his sins. So what he's saying is, this man goes out, let's say he sins, right? And it causes harm. And so now he complains about the consequences. But the fact is, uh, he was responsible for the situation, so, once again, the Bible has a lot to say about uh, the consequences of complaining. And one of them right here in one verse in Numbers chapter 11, it says that these people kept complaining and complaining and complaining and complaining. And once again, it's one thing if you have a problem to sit down and talk about it in order to find a way, Victoria, to resolve it. But to sit there and just complain and complain, with what that happens is it remo most people that complain, they remove themselves from the equation of trying to make it better. And all they want to do is complain. So once again, uh, this is Thanksgiving. So Thanksgiving or complaining, we have to decide. These, uh, two, these words express two contrast attitudes in God's children regarding His dealing with them. Notice God did deal with them. And it was such a deal, uh, a dealing that people died. God allowed them to die. So we need to be very cautious of, of this deal called the sin of complaining. Uh, you know, there's, it's amazing. Up in uh, uh, South Dakota, uh, in fact, the little city is called Yankton, South Dakota. The home of, it's, it, there's a sign out front. It says, the home of 30,000 friendly people and a few sore heads. You know, and the truth is we've all been a sore head from time to time. And now we may know uh, by a different term, it's called griping. It's called grumbling, whining, or belly aching is another term that people talk about it. Uh, but the, in the King James Version, the, the common term was called murmuring. All right. So when you murmur, it's to cause trouble. And complaining does that. Uh, you can be disappointed and if you're disappointed, you, can, it's, you should have a conversation to see what you can do to help resolve the situation. But 
to murmur means to constantly give critic or criticism. So regardless of the word that we use to describe it, complaining always has the same symptoms. In fact, the dictionary explains it as an expression of unhappiness, dissatisfaction, or discontent. So complaining is the outward expression of being discontented from within. All right. And what happens is our emotions get involved at this point. So here it says that, that, uh, that, the, that people died, and in verse 2 of Numbers chapter 11, and the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. I love that verse. You see, the first thing you're to do, if you're disappointed and things aren't going your way or you feel hurt, the first thing to do is, is go to the Lord with it and let God deal with not only your heart, but their heart, and not only with your actions or lack of actions, but their actions or lack of actions, all right? So the first thing we see here in verse 2 is the people cried unto Moses. Now, they were blaming Moses earlier, but now they're, and they were blaming God, and we'll talk about this. But, uh, but yet, once, once you open the door to communicate with God, notice, the fire of God was what? Quenched, okay? The judgment stopped. And he called the name of the place uh, Tiberah because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. And verse 4, and the mixed, M-I-X-T, the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. Circle that, all right? And the children of Israel who wept again and again, who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, cucumbers and melons and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlics. Verse 6, But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. Now we're not going to teach about the manna. Uh, but it's a little white corn door seed. You understand the story. But for time's sake, this is our Thanksgiving. And I, like I said, I normally preach this during a Sunday school message, but we're no longer having Sunday school because of the restrictions that we've got. So we're doing it during the main service. But it's such an important message because complaining, uh, you know, there was a, it reminds me of a man that he got, uh, Libby got a lot, large sum of money from an inheritance. So he decided, he was always complaining about everything. So he decided, and he went out and bought this little farm, and he asked his wife, well, you know, he complained about the farm they bought. He complained about where it's located. He complained, and he said, what should we name it? She said, well, let's call it Belly Acres. You know, some of you will catch that a little later. Now, uh, th th this message probably will not uh, uh, apply to most of us. Why? Uh, this morning, because most of us do not believe that we have a problem with complaining. But you probably know someone who needs to hear it, so it might be you're good for you to listen on. All right? So, but complaining seems to have become the great American pastime. We live in a, in a complaining society. Uh, people gripe about everything, and they gripe about everyone. All right. Uh, they compl uh, the complaining does not seem to be, uh, uh, you say, it doesn't sound, sound like a popular pastime, but it's become a popular pastime in our nation. Couples get together for an evening of fellowship, and the first thing you know, uh, they, they begin to what? The conversation is not about, the, about life and, and fun. It's normally, it's about someone or something, and it turns into a conversation of complaining about someone or uh, something that happened. And you think about employees. Employees complain about the company for they work. You know, they, they don't, you don't understand. Somebody thought that uh, you were worth hiring, that you were going to benefit the company. And for you, you have to understand, that's not just a job. That's the roof over your head. That's the food that goes in your belly. That's the uh, uh, medicine that you might need to buy. It's also the shelter. It's also the clothing. And so you have to understand when you choose a career, whether it's flipping a hamburger or whether it's becoming a doctor, it's still we, we serve the community and, and we get rewarded for our time for doing so. But employees complain about their company for which they work, and students complain about their teachers and the workloads, and, and they complain it seems to be a normal procedure this day. You know, complaining is so common today, that, uh, these days, that uh, we call it a way of life. It's just a way of life, you know? Uh, but just about everybody complains. 
And, and you would say, well, we complain about the teachers, we complain about the traffic, we complain about the taxes, we complain about our troubles and everything, but the, the, the commonness of complaining does not make it right. You see, the Word of God comes down very hard on the sin of complaining because of the results that complaining causes, right? You know what pre- preschoolers, let me complain, they say, I don't want to take a nap. All right, children complain, my teacher gives me too much homework. Uh, teenager complains, you never let me do anything. Uh, moms complain, how many times have I uh, told you to make your bed, right? Dads complain, I work hard all week long and I come home and, 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 and everybody gets on my case about not getting everything fixed. And then the wife says, well, I work hard, hard all week long and no one appreciates me and, 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 I, and or the work that I do. You know, so somebody had, I like this, somebody said, I heard a preacher one time say that, that uh, on the seventh day, God rested from creation. And on the eighth day, he started answering the complaints, you know. And so few sins are as ugly to God as the sin of complaining because of what it causes, all right, the harm that it causes. Uh, there, there seems to be very little thankfulness during Thanksgiving. There's very little gratitude today among God's people, but a whole lot of complaining. Complaining is part of our culture now, but, but it's sure not anything new. It's been around from the beginning of time. It started with Adam. Adam complained about his wife and said, well, it was the woman that thou gavest me. That's the reason why we're in trouble. You know, it all started from there. Uh, but complaining is one of the most prevalent sins among Christians. And we have to see it as a sin. If we don't, we're going to ignore it, all right? And those who never think of committing any gross sins, yet they're all, we're all guilty of a sin based on Numbers chapter 11 that caused many to die because God got so angry about it, all right? And so uh, when you start complaining against God and His, His providential will for your life, you begin to murmur, you begin to fuss, begin to fight, to grumble, to complain against God. It's a sin, and we have to recognize it as a sin. So the, the question is, do Christians living in America today know the dangers of complaining? Well, obviously they don't because we do it all the time. I'll give you an example. Oh my gosh, this hot weather. Oh my gosh, it's freezing outside. Oh my gosh, it's raining. And I looked up, because we live in Lubbock, so it's been about nine months now, but I looked it up and rain is in the dictionary, all right? But when it does rain, we complain. Oh my God, it's rain. It ruined our plans, all right? So complaining, hi Maddie, is a symptom of deep-seated spiritual problems. We are in Numbers chapter 11, verse 1. And we're dealing with the sin of complaining. So complaining is a symptom that is deep-seated. It's a spiritual problem. That's why God got upset, all right? It's a failure to trust God. It's a failure to be submissive to His providential provisions in your life. They were complaining about the manna about the food, you know, and, uh, and complaining surfaces when gratitude is missing. Did you get that? Complaining surfaces when gratitude is missing. And so, but God responds to complaining in, in Numbers chapter 11, verse 1, and, and he says, when they complained about the manna, it says, the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. He got really upset about it. And so Christians who complain about their circumstances would do well to to stop and think about how God is watching and how God's going to respond, okay? So God has some great blessings for people. Uh, His people in Israel, He delivered them uh, supernaturally from the slavery that was in Egypt, protected them from their enemies as they've gotten to this place in Numbers chapter 11, And He's provided food for them, water for them, and and yet they're still complaining. Uh, He miraculously uh, provided a daily bread source that would nourish them. It had all the vitamins, all the nutrients they need to survive, but they complained about that. Still they complained. They complained about their food. They complained about the, uh, the imaginary luxuries they thought they had left behind in Egypt, which was a lie. It was not a luxury. It was barely enough to survive on. Uh, and yet uh, they complained about their leaders. In Numbers 11, 1, And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the, and the Lord heard it. His anger was kindled. It was set ablaze. All right? So let me give you three reasons today uh, why God is upset 
uh, uh, Maddie, about our complaining, why it displeased him. Number one, complaining denies God's sovereignty in your life. In fact, you know, Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? And that's what complaining does. God teaches us a lot of lessons. And so we, we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing in the right way. So the sovereignty of God, of the universe, uh, showered his power over the Israelites. The Israelite leaves Egypt wealthy. They go through the Red Sea on dry land and God destroys their enemies. Man, what a blessing. God kind of cleaned it all up. But yet their success in entering the promised land depended on the sovereignty of God. They'd have never made it if God hadn't opened up the Red Sea. They'd have never made it if God hadn't protected them from the armies of Pharaoh. And they forgot that. And yet they murmured and complained against Moses and Aaron, their leaders, right? And they're calling to question God's ability to carry out his own will. So complaining is just the surface symptom of a much deeper problem called discontent. All right? And so the Bible strongly, once again, condemns complaining, the murmurings, the, the, the grumbling, the griping, the complaining. Uh, I, I know, Maddie, you've got people that work for you, and I probably, you probably never hear anybody complain. How about constantly, right? You know, and, uh, but the, what is the solution? The solution uh, to this problem is to recognize our sin. And, and when we do that, that is to realize and acknowledge that our Heavenly Father always has what is best for us, even down to the little problems He's allowed us to face. Every problem I've gone through, every challenge I've gone through, there was a lesson for me to learn. Something of value that maybe I, was, I, I wasn't seeing it in my life. And... Um, so uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, it says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to what? The purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. So uh, finally, when they complained about the manna, God got angry. But let me, let me help you with this. Uh, Victoria, you cook a wonderful, well, I'll use Loopy today because he, he made this wonderful meal. Matt, you came on the right day, man. But he's got this wonderful meal back there. And if we went back, he said, take a taste out of it. The one thing he doesn't want to hear is, oh, my gosh, this is horrible. This is terrible, right? It was really good, by the way. We're going to eat some more here in a minute. But, you know, when people do something nice for someone, they don't want you to complain about it. They want you to be fairly honest, but if, but I've seen people, I've seen people try to cook and, and they would say, how is it? And you have to say, God's good. Amen. That's what it is with my cooking sometimes, right? But, but being honest is one thing, but complaining, it tears you up from the inside out and it spreads like a fire. All right. So I, I, am I in a better position today? You know, who am I to, to put the almighty God under cross examination, right? God, why? You're, you're cross-examining God, right? So am, am, am I in a better position than he is to judge what is and what is not good for me? And how far can I see into the future? Who am I to strike out against God and start complaining? But we do. You remember in Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas was in prison. And, and, and you, see, you don't see Paul complaining. He's rejoicing. Why? Why is he rejoicing? He's in a very bad situation. Here's why. He's trusting God's sovereignty. He knows that God holds the present and God holds the future, right? So in Numbers chapter 11, he went on to complain about, uh, they began to complain about their, their wilderness diet, right? They went on to talk about what great food they had back in, when they were in slavery, which was a lie. We have a tendency when we get discontent to go back and think that life was better without that person. Or life was better before I went to that place. Or what, and it's a lie. My life is far better now than what is, when I was walking away from God and doing my own thing and causing so much harm in my life and everybody else's. And yet we have a tendency to think, oh, life back then was better. But it was actually worse. Does that make sense? So that's the problem with complaining. It distorts your vision, right? They forgot that they were what? Slaves. They were complaining about the food, but they were slaves. Listen, I'd rather be a little bit hungry and free than to have a bunch of melons and be in slavery. 
All right. So but they forgot they were slaves. Maybe you forgot that you were just a sinner on the wrong path. Maybe you forgot how lonely you really were and how dis discouraged you were. But then there was a time when you got saved, you got in the church. It's like, man, everything went, wow, why? Because you, you see God being sovereign in your life. But then you begin to miss church. You begin to miss reading the Word of God. And we lose that vision of the sovereignty of God. So we complain to God, right? So we all get a little nearsighted. Why? Uh, just as... With all the irritation, with all the frustrations right in front of us, we lose our perspective. Let me say it again. When you're irritated, you're nearsighted, you're upset, you're angry, you're blaming everybody for everything and, and, and everything else, we begin to lose our perspective. We blow today's problems, I believe, way out of proportion. And we forget the larger picture, the great things of God that God's doing in our lives. You know, there are some people today who woke up, and I'm going to face it, be honest with you. Some people are saying, I got to go to the hospital now. Got an infection. You and I woke up saying, wow, I, I, I'm healthy. I'm alive. We, there, were two, there were two things for most of us, and I'd probably say 99.9% .9 of us. When you woke up this morning and you opened your eyes, two miracles took place. You saw your left eye and your right eye. You were able to swallow. Some people can't do that. You were able to blink. You were able to get up and walk around. You were able to take and use two feet, two more miracles. You used two hands, two more miracles, right? So complaining is always an expression of unbelief toward God's sovereignty in your life, all right? So in fact, Romans 8, 28 says, we quote it all the time, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to what? His purpose, all right? So if the Christian really believes that the Lord is in control of their life, then we, we need to look back and say, you know, all things work together for good, according to what? His purpose. So let me ask you, have you complained any, any time this week? Yeah, we all have, right? And the person that you live with, have they complained to? We're, see, now we're in trouble, all right? All right. So, but here's the deal. Uh, so don't, don't be too quick to answer this now already. Libby was the first one to go, oh yeah, I've complained a lot this week, right? So what are the comments about the weather like? How many already complained about the weather? The wind was too high. The dust storms were coming in. We live in Lubbock. You know, it's going to always be dusty here. But how do you speak about your spouse? What kinds of things do you say about your job? Do you complain about someone who did not treat you the way you thought you should have been treated? Do you complain about how they've disappointed you? Religious people are normally the, the biggest culprits. I hate to say that, but it's true. Why? Uh, we're, we're never really thankful for the cold weather, the hot weather, the rainy weather, the cloudy weather, the sunny weather, you know. And, and have you ever complained uh, uh, how the weather ruins your plans? Why well, is planning on going fishing? Hey, I learned a lesson a long time ago. Fish still bite in the rain. You just don't want to get wet, right? All right. So complaining is, is, is directed at God who has ordered your circumstances. And that was hard for me to understand for years. I always want to say, God, I don't understand why uh, I have to go through this. I don't understand why this is happening. And it's okay to, to talk to God. But to sit there and that's all you do because you, you replace talking to God with complaining to God, which you step back and say, this is not my problem, it's not my fault, it's all your fault, God. That's what Adam did. He said, you're the one that gave me the wife in the first place, right? So, but what, it's a serious sin. It's why? Here's why, right here. Number one, complaining changes you. Number two, complaining changes other people who hear and see you complain, and it changes their perspective of you. All they do is complain. If you want to know how serious it is with God, he is, he, in Numbers chapter 11, he destroyed people for it. And he says that he, he did it to them. He slaughtered them in the wilderness. And it's an example to you and I today of a warning how God feels about this sin of complaining. Have you ever heard? Listen, there are two types of eyes. One is bush eyes. Now, what does that mean? 
There was a missionary walk. I love giving this illustration every year. There was a missionary that was walking along the trail with the natives. And all of a sudden, one of the natives uh, uh, sh uh, uh, shot his gun right near the missionary. And the missionary thought that he was shooting at him. But he killed a huge green snake that was coming down out of the tree that would have grabbed the missionary, right? And he said, how come I didn't see it? I, or see it? And the, the, the native said, you'll no have bush eyes. All right? And so they kept walking down the road and everything. All of a sudden, uh, the native grabbed him and pulled him back from, there's a bunch of shrubbery over here. And there was a bunch of different colors and darkness and shadows and everything else. And sure enough, he reached in and grabbed that missionary and jerked him back. And the missionary fell on the ground and everything. He said, what would you do that for? He says, leper. And he looked over and there was this spotted leper there. He said, how come I didn't see that? He said, you, know, you don't have no bush eyes, right? And uh, so he said, well, why don't I have bush eyes? He says, because when you walk on the path, all you're doing is looking at your feet. You're not looking what's ahead at the consequences that could be in front of you. All right. So what what will he, 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 and he asked him and he said, he said, he said, you understand, these were dangerous situations for me and I should have seen it. How come? So you have to get your bush eyes and bush eyes lets you, lets you see beyond the path and sees what's in front of you way out there. All right. So what does it mean? It means become aware, aware of everything, aware of everyone around you to look beyond your feet. Look beyond your anger and your frustration and your bitterness and start looking for what lies ahead of you, whether it's good or bad. All right? So what do we need? I said there were two types of eyes. There's bush eyes and then there's God's eyes. All right? It's important. All right? So all we can see is, Lord, you know, I, I, I don't understand my situation. I don't know why it's going the way it's going. But I'm going to trust in Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good according to those who love God, according to your purpose, God. Doesn't mean I have to like it. You know, there was a purpose when I would get in trouble and my mom and dad would spank me. You know, they were trying to get my attention. Apparently I was stubborn enough. I didn't listen. So communication was out. Maybe grounding was out. And they had to get my attention. But what I didn't know is they really had my best interest at heart. They wanted me to learn to look in the future so I don't make those decisions that put me in those situations, all right? So we need God eyes, right? We, we see God where others just see leaves. We see God where others just see rocks and vines. We see God when others see only a coffin. We see others when, when others only see the loss of a job. We see God whenever others only see a divorce. We, we need to see God in all things. And you say, why? This will stop our complaining. God, I know I don't like the situation. I don't feel like I'm in control of it. But I know that you are. So I'm just going to see you. And, and I know that I'm going to learn some things from this. And I know I probably need it. And it's hard to thank God for those situations. When somebody's just, I mean, they're just focused on you and they're railing. Lord, I want to thank you for this person railing on me. And you say, why would you do that? Because apparently there's something that we need to learn. Maybe that we've hurt someone and didn't realize it. Maybe we need to realize what we did so we don't repeat that again. So it's one thing to have a conversation with someone, but when the emotions and the fires inside get to going over, nobody's listening. In Numbers chapter 13, verse 30 through 33, and Caleb stilled the people or quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up once and possess it, for we will be able to overcome it. That's in Numbers chapter 13. There's the promised land. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. God said, go get it. And they said, well, we don't, have, we don't see it with God eyes. We're kind of looking at it with bush eyes. Right? And verse 32 of Numbers chapter 13, And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land uh, through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. 
There's the fear factor. And all the people that, that, that uh, we saw in there are men of great stature. These are some really big, gigantic men out there. There's no way we're going to be able to conquer this. Verse 33, And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which came uh, come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers as they were in their sight. You know what they were really saying? We cannot do what God has told us to do. It's just too hard to imagine. It's just too, the people are just too big. The problem is just too big. So would you say that in verse 33 they were exaggerating it? God had already given them the land. He's already going to give them the victory. And so many times we exaggerate our problems when we complain. We make, you ever heard this phrase? You make a mountain out of a what? A mountain out of a mohill, right? Numbers 14, 36, it talks about the ten spies. They affected the whole nation with their complaining. And the whole nation missed out on the blessings of God. So I've learned this, that the sin of complaining is so contagious, Maddie, that it spreads like a wildfire. You let one dog bark, and the whole neighborhood of dogs begins to bark. You let one frog croak in a pond, next thing you know, they're all croaking, right? Uh, one dove coos, I got a bunch of doves, and one goes, coo you know, Coo-hoo. that's what they sound like. Now, don't criticize me too bad for my coo sound, but Coo-hoo. that's what they sound like. Next thing you know, we've got like nine of them, they're all going crazy. You can hear them all through the house. You can hear them outside. Why? It just takes one. When we got cats, when one cat meows, they all begin to meow. When one kid cries, they all begin to cry, right? When one person gets disgruntled in a church, it goes like wildfire. When one person gets disgruntled in, the, in a nation, if you're not careful, it will spread like a wildfire. Complaining does not change anything or make the situation better. In fact, it amplifies the frustration. It spreads discontent, and it spreads discord. And the Bible says God hates those who sow discord among the brethren, and that's what complaining does. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 through 19. Now the King James, the six things does God, does the Lord hate? Yea, seven, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness uh, uh, that speaks lies, and he that what? Soweth discord among the brethren. So complaining denies God's sovereignty. Complaining disrupts the Christian unity. Uh, Complaining discredits Christian testimonies. All right? So we have to understand that we're we're to do all things without murmuring or disputing. All right? A young girl surprised her mother with a very beautiful, unexpected gift. And and, and she had purchased with her own allowance. And the girl uh, said, Mom, this is for you because you work so hard and nobody seems to appreciate it around here. Her mother looked at her and said, well, your father works hard too. She goes, yeah, I know, but he doesn't complain about it. Some of you will catch that a little bit later, all right? But we fall apart during our trials. And, 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 and the world says, where's your God that you believed in when you need him the most? Where was your God? You know, Paul and Silas must have been a tremendous testimony in the Philippian jail. What if they had been murmuring and complaining? And then what, you know, if Silas, uh, Maddie, if Silas had turned to Paul and said, Paul, you think you're such a big shot, big minister out there for the Lord and everything. You had to show off and cast a demon out of, uh, out of that man. Now look at the trouble we're in. Uh, why, why couldn't you just have left that demon possessed man alone? If that dialogue had been that, Instead of them giving praises to God, then I wonder what would have happened to the jailer that turned to them and said, what must I do to be saved? You see, he, he, even in their situation, that jailer that was lost saw how they were responding by giving praise and trust to God. Praise and trust to God. But you know, I think we've got to where we don't trust God like we used to. 
You say, oh, but preacher, now I'm getting angry. Well, you might need to. My, I, when, I, when God laid this on my heart and I was doing my research, I got a little angry too. Because you know what it did? It's like a mirror. It showed me that I had some places that I need to work on. All right? So most of the time we grumble. We, we do not have any reason to do so. Most of the people who grumble are like the man who was always complaining. He was never happy about any things. Uh, and, 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 and such as the day when he walked in the hardware store. And I love telling this story. He says, listen, i got a lot of trees to cut down. My hand saw is just... I need something that's really going to take and get the job done. And, they, and the guy said, man, I'm telling you right now, he says, uh, uh, you, you can cut down six trees an hour with this machine. The guy said, that's what I want. So he bought it, went out there, spent the whole day. And he came back the next day. He was fussing and grumbling and complaining. He said, the chainsaw's defective. He said, I can only cut down one tree all day long. And the, the salesman says, well, let me take a look at it. He looks over at it. It's got gas. It's got oil. He turns the button on. And he goes, and he goes, and the guy says, what's that noise? So maybe you'll catch that a little bit later, all right? You see, he had the right tool. Just didn't know how to use it. You see, we got the Bible. We just don't know how to use it. We got the presence of God. We just don't know how to use it, right? So there once was a poor lady who was always complaining. She had uh, uh, no blessings, uh, uh, and nothing to be thankful for. And her granddaughter uh, gave her what's called a missionary box with the words written on it, What shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits to me? It was a missionary box because uh, what would happen is if, if you didn't do something right, you put a penny in there. And after a while, that thing would fill it with pennies. You'd give it to a missionary to go do something good with it. So the niece told her to put a penny in the box for every benefit that she could discover in her life. Well, the woman replied, uh, she says, well, I guess the heathen won't get much out of that box, you know, and, and, but a few pennies won't break me, so I'll keep the benefits out there. I'll think about it. And uh, the box sat there all week long without one penny going in that box. And after the next church service, the woman, uh, she didn't attend. And the niece came around to tell her about the preacher that, that, that night and, and how he talked about the Indians and their plight at Thanksgiving. And how they gave thanks. That's why we're doing, call this one of our Thanksgiving sermons, right? And the woman says, well, I'm thankful I, I, I'm where I am and not one of those Indians on that reservation. And then he said, well, there's your first penny. She went and got a penny and put it in the box. Several days later, the woman secured a new renter for one of her rooms. And she felt, she, she you know, uh, instead of complaining, you know, I, that's a blessing. So she put a penny in the box. Before long, the, the box was now heavy with pennies upon pennies inside the box. Each of us has have been blessed in numerous of ways. The old song, count your many blessings, name them one by one. And the more we think about how blessed we are, the more we'll be thankful. A wise preacher once said, among those sins most exquisitely fitted to, in, to injure the soul and to destroy the testimony Few can equal the sin of complaining. Complainers are actually missionaries of misery. And complaining always hurts those, not just themselves, but those around them. Complaining is the outburst that hurt, that's heard through criticizing. And so it, it, it takes no special skill, no special talent, no special IQ to take and criticize and complain. Because anybody can do it. And Christians should not be complainers. The Bible is clear that complaining is, is repulsive to our Heavenly Father. It's a serious sin because of the damage that it does. Two boys were eating some grapes one day. And, 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 and uh, one of the boys said, man, aren't these grapes sweet? And the other boy says, yeah, I guess so, but they're full of seeds. They went into the garden, the first uh, boy explained, look at those big, beautiful red roses. And the other one said, yeah, but they, they're full of thorns. It was a warm day, so they stopped at the store for a soft drink. And after several swallows, the second youngster complained, my bottle is half empty already. But the first boy responded, he looked at it and said, well, mine is still half full. All right? So many believers are the negative thinking boy in the story. They always look at life through dark glasses. 
like the children of Israel in today's scripture, they complained, they grumbled, and, and, and that they should be praising God for His gracious provisions. So the question is, will you be truly thankful starting today, or will you just go ahead and continue to complain? So what's the conclusion? Complaining denies God's sovereignty. Complaining disrupts Christian unity. And complaining, it discredits our Christian testimony. So what is our challenge? Our challenge, all right? I believe our challenge today is my mom used to tell me, if you ain't got something nice to say, don't say anything at all. So you got to learn to bite your tongue, right? And before you speak, she also said, if you don't have anything good to say, then don't say anything at all. We know that. Especially when you're angry. Bite your tongue or don't say anything at all, right? Had a wise mom, but you know what? She learned that from a wise God. Okay? So the great ministry besides sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ is the ministry of restoration. Instead of, instead of pointing your finger and stepping back saying, you're the reason I'm not. It's your fault, not mine. That will never solve anything. But if I were to say, hey, I admit I made a mistake and I'm sorry. And I hope that we're talking about two people trying to be spiritual here. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? And then ask the question, what can I do that's fair to you and fair to me that I can start the process of making this better for us? You see, because complaining says I'm not going to take an action but just voice my opinion. I'm just going to throw a fit. But having a conversation says let's find a solution. Let's fix this. Galatians 6.1 is our last verse. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are what? Spiritual. They're applying spiritual principles, right? Restore such as one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be what? Tempted. Rather than complain, set out to restore. Rather than complain, set out to to restore, all right? So do it for others. Do it for yourself and do it for Christ. Become an example and a reflection of having a real Jesus in your life. Don't sit there and and I'm not going to sit there and call myself a Christian, a Christ-like person, if I'm not going to apply Christ-like principles. And I make mistakes. Sometimes I wake up in the morning and without saying a word, I can make people mad. And I, I promise them, I say, look, I didn't sit up all night long writing down, making a list. What can I do to really make Maddie bad today? That wasn't all my thought. Well, you didn't call me on the phone. You didn't text me on, you know. But you know what? Here's the deal. If you're waiting for them to call or text and your feelings are hurt, and, and I posted something on this, I'm just going to love them anyway. Because I, I, I would love for somebody to contact me back. I, I don't want to feel invisible. And I know you don't want to, and I don't want to make you feel invisible. So, yes, I will always give a response. I may be in a challenged situation. It may take me a little while to get to you, but I'll always get back to you. Why? Because you're valuable to me. And I'd hope I'd be valuable to them. But if I'm not valuable to them enough for them to respond, then I'm just going to love them and pray for them and ask God to restore them. And ask God, restore me too. And restore them. Why? Because I don't want a bitter spirit. I don't want to feel angry and upset. I want to feel free. I want to know I did my very best. And if I made a mistake, I claim 1 John 1, 9. I confess my sins. He's faithful, willing, and just to forgive me of all my sins. And to cleanse me from what? All unrighteous. Which means he's going to cleanse the thing. Help me to clean clean up my life. That I don't keep doing the things. He's going to cleanse me from all unrighteous righteous is doing the wrong things so i want a clean mind a clean heart and a clean life and guess what you get out of that you're also going to get a clean conscience out of it too and that's going to benefit everybody how about the thief on the cross boy you talk about a man under conviction we deserve this and yet he looked to christ as the answer said you're god i'm asking you to come into my i want you to come into my heart i want you to save me i want to i want to go live with you will you remember me when you go to your kingdom and Jesus turned right then and there and he wanted him to know. He said, I'm glad you confessed this, what he's saying. And guess what? That's all that was required. And you believed in me. So guess what? Today thou will be with me in paradise. Maybe today you need to finally come clean and say, you know, I'm going to quit complaining about the churches, quit complaining about my job, quit complaining. I'm going to be a praiser. I'm going to start giving praise. 
And even if it hurts, even if I'm going through a bad time, I'm going to find a way, uh, Victoria, to just say, Lord, if I don't have the answers, I know you do. And I'm, I'm just going to trust you today. I'm going to get through today. and I want me to be a better me today because of you. And I want to touch somebody with your love through me. Father, I pray if there be one here that doesn't know you as Savior, they say, Lord, I too am a sinner. I confess that you are God. You died for me. You paid for my sins. You arose on the third day. So here it is. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart. Save me. And when your Holy Spirit comes in, help me to yield to his leadership and guidance in my life, to mold me, to shape me, to be the type of person that you want me to be. Help my faith to grow in you no matter what my circumstances are. Lord, help me to be, hopefully one day, a Christian. That's where somebody sees me. They're saying, there's a Christ living in you. You reflect Christ. Lord, what a compliment that would be. I love you. And thank you for today's message that you told to all of us. Hugs and kisses in Jesus' name. And visit our website at lyitl.org. Love you in the Lord. Good night.